Misty? Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, now we are ready. Um, all right, like I said, we'll do a Q&A with Leslie and some bats at the end of the presentation. So get excited for that. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and thanks, special thanks to anybody that was at our October book club. Um, that was The Secret Lives of Bats with famous bat conservationist Merlin Tuttle, who actually joined us for the evening, which was amazing. He answered a ton of our burning bat questions um, and busted a bunch of bat myths, which I'm sure we'll do some more of tonight. Um, and we are grateful that you're joining us here tonight to learn about and protect these incredible animals. Um, and we have a very special night in store for you. Um, tonight, we at Wild Virginia are going to join with Bat Conservation and Rescue of Virginia for an evening of bat extravaganza. Um, and as some of you had said, it is spooky season, it's October, um, and it's time to take to the skies with one of the most misunderstood mammals ever. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Leslie Sturges to you, who is our wonderful presenter tonight. Um, Leslie, has, Leslie Sturges has been rehabilitating bats in Northern Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley for 20 years. She is a frequent lecturer on all things bat at state wildlife conferences and provides training for master naturalists, municipal animal services, and public health officials. She has even addressed Congress on the plight of bats post white nose syndrome. In non-COVID years, her educational presentations reached thousands of people. She has seen almost 2000 bats in her rehab practice. Oops, let me switch my slide here. Um, and she has handled hundreds more during various field projects. She knows bats. Uh, Leslie is currently the founder and the president of Bat Conservation and Rescue of Virginia, formerly the Save Lucy campaign, if any of you know that. Um, and it is the only conservation organization in Virginia dedicated to native bat species. So without further ado, Leslie, thank you. And I'm turning it over to you. All right. Thank you all so much. And I'm really impressed. I'm looking at the participant count go up and up and up. And I'm like, yay, thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks so much to Wild Virginia for having me. I really appreciate this and um, being part of the amazing effort that is Bat Week. And um, I just I want everyone to know that this is a national international effort now. And there was some traffic, Nat Geo picked it up on some of their social media. So you never know, we may have a bat week akin to shark week soon. And you know, we'll all be on TV talking about bats instead of Zoom. So hey, we can hope, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and kick off this presentation because anyone who's seen any of my presentations knows that I'm kind of information heavy. And I have a hard time getting it all in in time. So please ask questions at the end. Um, if you have questions that don't get answered or if you have more questions, you, I am easy to find and reach. And if you don't hear back from me right away, it's because I forgot. And so feel free to reach out again. I'm, I'm easy that way. So I'm going to talk about the natural history, uh, natural history and conservation of bats in Eastern North America because we're really lucky here in Virginia. We're sort of at that north-south interface. So we actually have really high diversity for an Eastern state. Uh, the state with the highest diversity is Texas. And they, I think they have 45 of 48 species that occur in the United States. In Virginia, we only have 16, but that's a lot. So um, that's what I'm gonna talk about. And let's get this slide to go forward. There we go. So the basics. I always have to go and start at the basics just to make sure everybody's on up to speed. And I already see I have an error in my slide, but uh, mammal, bats are mammals, right? They belong to the order Chiroptera, which roughly translates into hand wing, chiro, hand, taro wing. They're the only mammal capable of self-powered flight. So they flap in order to fly, they don't glide. They are the second largest group of mammals. And actually that 1300 species number is incorrect. We are now up to 1400 species. Just new ones keep getting discovered or named or described. So bats comprise 20% of all mammalian species. So that's huge. The only group that's bigger are the rodents. So this is a very important and very diverse group of animals. Most bats are insectivores. But when you have 1,400 species, you get, have a lot of room for diversity. So you've got 
frog feeders, fish specialists, nectarivores, frugivores, and even we have the famous vampire bats. Um, so wide variety of feeding strategies and a very wide variety of roosting habits. Um, but they are mostly nocturnal. There are some crepuscular species that are more active at dawn or dusk, but most bats are nocturnal insectivore. They are what we term a heterothermic endotherm, which basically means the old term was warm blooded for endotherms, which means there's an internal metabolism that keeps everything relatively stable, but bats can shift that metabolic state depending on their needs. So they go into a daily torpor to conserve energy where they are actually operating at a lower metabolic state than they are in the middle of the night when they're chasing bugs or, or the females who are lactating 24 hours, they're in a different metabolic state. So that, that state shifts and that allows them to use cool things like hibernation to get through times when they don't have bugs to eat. The other really cool thing about them is they break all the small mammal rules. So if you think about your average mouse, they don't live long, but they have a ton of babies. Whereas bats actually live really long lives for their size and have very few young. So bats are actually more akin to the way humans and other large mammals um, have reproduce and sustain the population. So one thing I do wanna point out before I move off this slide is to just have a glance at these wings and recognize that the structure in the wing is very similar to you um, in that these are the fingers and the thumb is um, right here. And then you can see the arm, the shoulder girdle, you know, and the entire body is actually makes up part of the airfoil of the wing. So everywhere that the bat can bend a joint that's in, um, involved with that membrane that you see wrapping from shoulder to ankle and all the way back around again, everywhere that a joint bends within that membrane, the bat can change the angle of the wing. So that allows for some pretty incredible behavior. As far as life histories of bats go, again, they are very long lived for their size. This picture here is a Brant's bat, which is a European species. One was recaptured in the wild in, in Russia at 41 years old. This is a four gram animal. Um, the a little brown bat was recaptured at 34 years old. And I do believe there are others um, since that recapture that clocked in at over 30. So it, it's not a real outlier apparently. It's not that unusual for them to live these incredibly long lives. A uh, little brown bat and these little myotis like brants only have one pup a year. So they don't have lots of litters and they don't have large litters. And then our really common big brown bat has two. So um, that we used to, well, in ecology, we talk about K-selected and R-selected. So these guys are, are more, again, more along animals like us that have fewer young, um, but live a long time and put a lot of effort into those young. So the other thing to consider with bats is because of flight, regardless of how small or large they are, they have huge ranges. And when you start thinking about animals that maybe spend the summer in, oh, I don't know, Fairfax, and spend the winter in Highland County, and they only weigh seven grams, I mean, that's a substantial amount of landscape they're covering for a really tiny animal. So um, they, they're, the ability they have to inhabit space is pretty amazing for such a tiny thing. And then um, I put in this home range for Tadarida. Tadarida is the free tail bat and they've actually been pretty extensively studied. They are the fastest flying animal in flight, not a dive like a peregrine, but actually flying. They track Tadarida at um, some insane airspeed that nothing else reaches. But anyway, um, they also forage up to 40 miles in a night. So they really are inhabiting a lot of space for this minuscule animal. And then you have seasonal changes in their um, lives. So they are inhabiting different parts of the region. So when you consider a bat's home range, there's a summer home range, there's a winter home range, and there's the space in between. So their habitat needs are very large. Yeah, mammals that fly. So just briefly, a little bit more about wing structure is 
the um, skeletal bits here we share with, with the other vertebrates. Um, and birds have solved the flight issue by taking these forelimbs and sort of solidifying and stiffening everything. And then they use feathers to make the airfoil, whereas bats sort of shorten the humerus, elongated the radius, and then really elongated the meta, um, tar, meta, <laughs> metatarsals and phalanges, metacarpals and phalanges. I was getting confused between feet and hands there. Um, metacarpals and phalanges to make this really elongated strut system that holds that skin membrane. So the membrane is really elastic and thin. And if you hold a bat wing up to light, you can actually see light penetrating through it. So it's very thin, but it's really heavily um, enervated. It's got capillary and venous blood flow. And it's actually got really thin striated muscles that help it all just kind of um, shrink down when they aren't flying and expand when they are flying. It's truly remarkable stuff. And then um, this illustration just shows the different patagia, which is what we call the membranes. And then do notice though that this tail membrane that they have, this helps you when you're looking at them in flight and you're trying to figure out if you're looking at a bird or a bat, um, bats come to a point when they're flying at dusk and they always, they, they flap. They don't spend any time gliding. So if you're not sure if you're looking at a swift or a bat, that's one quick way to tell. So social structure is really important to bats because when you're a small mammal, you can solve some challenges through being social or you, um, you can maybe put some energy into growing a whole lot of fur if you're going to live, say, alone and outside in the trees. So what we sort of have a loose distinction between solitary and colonial bats, which tracks with foliage roosting and crevice roosting. So here we have a hoary bat tucked into, I admit, it's fake silk foliage, but it's one of the ways we are able to keep them comfortable when they're in rehabilitation. So here she is tucked away and um, you can see a little bit of just how dense her fur is. So this is a solitary foliage roosting bat that would live on her own out in the leaves of trees unless she had pups actively nursing or learning from her. As opposed to our colonial bats, which tend to live together in groups in crevices. And one thing that I hope jumps out at you is the difference in the coloration of these two animals. This one is multicolored to break up its outline, has some counter shading, some points. So this is very difficult to see in the dappled light of tree foliage. These are brown because they live in a dark brown crevice. And these are, these are big brown bats, so they might be attics or under shutters or under sloughing bark or in a tree hollow, but in some dark, tight place where they all tend to clump together for the females. The, there are, there's actually gender differences in how they spend their lives. And did we have, if we had more time, I could talk to you at great length about that, but I won't. Um, so solitary tree bats, tend to live in tree foliage and are camouflaged to do so. So here we have some red bats and you can see, even though this is fake foliage, you can see like the, we've got the wing here and the counter colored uh, fingers of the wing. And you can even look and see some of the sort of fake foliage is tr trying to look like a real leaf. And you can just see how the colors sort of work out for this little red bat to actually look a lot like a dead leaf. And then here we have one in dappled light and you can see that the, you know, that sort of fur and the counter coloring and everything do help, does help break up the outline. And then over here we have again our hoary bat with her multiple colors. And this one just happens to have two pups attached. Another thing that um, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but they're very heavily furred because these guys need to be outside and deal with weather conditions that crevice bats don't. So they actually do have a furred tail membrane, which we affectionately refer to as the butt blanket. And that is something they use to great effect uh, to hold body heat in and to help protect them from rain and things like that out in the trees. 
And then back to our colonial crevice bats, we've got the, um, these dark bats that tend to want to live in tight places and live together. And if you're familiar with Bracken Cave in Texas, which I hope you are if you were, if you went to the book club talk, because uh, that is a Bat Conservation International slash Merlin Tuttle project, but that cave houses the largest aggregation of a single species of mammal that we know of. So that, those are the free-tailed bats in Texas. And so they can form these amazingly huge aggregations. And even historically here in this part of North America, we had little brown bat colonies that numbered into the thousands in barns and attics and big brown colonies that were in the hundreds. And I think everyone probably realizes we just don't see that anymore. These crevice bats use what's called a fusion fission, fission, fusion model of social structure. And basically what that means is there's a large population somewhere. Uh, we call it a meta colony. And so if you consider like maybe in your neighborhood, there are 20 colonies of bats and they're all, they all know each other. Those colonies tend to be, they preferentially stay together, but there's a lot of movement of individuals in between the different colonies. So there's a lot of information flow and there's a good reason if you're adapted to live in tree hollows that you might wanna be on speaking terms with the neighbors so that if something happens to your roost, you can go move in with others. And it's definitely the females and the young of those females that maintain these social relationships. But other animals that utilize this sort of structure are crows, elephants, some dolphins maybe, and definitely humans. So, uh, this is a highly intelligent, socially intelligent mammal. Um, and they, they are very tightly tied to those maternity colonies in the places where they grew up. So anyone who's experienced trying to get bats out of an attic knows that they come back looking because to them that is home. And so we call that site fidelity. They remember where they're from. There's probably generational memory of some of these roosts. So, um, a lot of social intelligence, a lot of intelligence, intelligence, and a really strong spatial memory. So, and again, these crevice bats are usually dark. I'm going to see if this will click through. Nope, it doesn't. Never mind. I this this bat box was really interesting because I had a close up, um, uh, and the person sent me another close up of it. What's really interesting is it mixed in with these big brown bats are actually some free tail bats. And um, what's happening with free tails is they're actually moving north. And it looks like they're able to sort of infiltrate into these big brown bat colonies. And it sort of um, blanks their social calls as they're exiting. So even if you're doing bat monitoring, you might not even pick up on the fact that you've got free tail bats in with your um, big brown bat colony. So I highly recommend sneaking out there and taking pictures or using binoculars during the day to see if maybe you've got some free tails in there. Then we have this group that I call the in-betweeners that are neither colonial in that they don't form large aggregations, nor are they true foliage dwellers because they don't live out in the leaves. They tend to use things like tree hollows or sloughing bark, but again, they don't form these large aggregations, so they don't need the sort of large voids that those um, big co colonial bats do. So semi-solitary tree bats is a good way to think of them. Um, you tend to see that they, like the, these silver hair bats, which are really heavy users of dead wood, tree hollows, slough, sloughing bark, they are sort of camouflaged to look a lot like bark. And then these little tricolor bats here, which are, they hibernate in caves, but they tend to use more open um, areas. Like when we think of human structures, we tend to see them underneath decks or um, in barn lofts that are more open. They aren't tucked into crevices so much. And I'm, I do believe their natural roost is tree hollows, but I, there's really not a whole lot known about some of these, even though the tricolor bat is now state endangered, but they do form small colonies and often just for reproduction, for, for pup rearing. Um, but bat lives change with the season. So a bat that's a colonial uh, crevice dweller, that lives with 200 bats in the summer may very well go hibernate with one or two other bats in a rock crack, you know, in a cliff face somewhere. So different strategies by season. So um, I, I just 
really want to make sure that everyone understands that there's no one size fits all for our bats. So when someone says, oh, yeah, that bat shouldn't be outside because bats hibernate all winter. Well, not all of ours hibernate all the time, all winter. So a lot, a lot of times you'll see bats flying around on a warmish winter evening. And that's because we have bats that use punctuated torpor to get through the winter. They don't hibernate. Um, you know, or, 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 or bats out during the day must have rabies. Well, maybe they're just thirsty and would like to get a drink of water. So blanket statements really don't, they never apply to nature, but they really don't apply to bats. Um, so here we are in fall, winter. We're actually in the middle of bat mating season and, high, and uh, migration season. So our males are very busy right now. This is when they mate. And this is when the males are out. They are, it turns out now that we have better acoustic monitoring, male, big brown males are out there singing love songs to attract females as they fly around. They hang out on walls trying to look tough. Um, you've got red bats who apparently mate by just running down females. Um, all kinds of craziness is going on right now. And, and this is the male season because the females are getting ready to go into hibernation or, or migrate out and they're taking, you know, they're not necessarily taking their young, but there's other young bats are following them. So they're getting ready to, to, to wrap up the season and males have a very important job to do right now and that is to mate. So by mating now, it allows the females to overwinter with sperm and then when they come out, wake up in spring, then that um, sperm fertilizes ova so they can start their pregnancies in a really good time to have enough time to raise the young. So, but this is an expensive time of year for males and they're getting in all kinds of trouble. And also young of the year are getting in all kinds of trouble because they don't really know what they're doing yet. Um, and I did throw the thing about the red bats in because they, they're, they're a very interesting animal, but I get pictures sent to me every year of two red bats like smashed into the ground and I don't know whether the females are just trying to do some avoidance maneuvers or what their strategy is, but they do crash. Um, they may supposedly mate in the air and, and crash regularly. Um, and then we're going to move into hibernation se season real soon. So we've got bats that are using caves are going into the caves and uh, they found the same bat in the same spot in the same cave year after year after year. So site fidelity also applies to winter hibernation. So those cave bats are gonna go in, survive on their storage fat for the entirety of winter and then come out uh, mid-April-ish is about when they come out. Migratory bats like our red bats and our hoary bats, silver hair bats are either moving into the area, moving out of the area or staying around. So they, even within the same species, they can be using different strategies to get through the winter. Um, the cold hardy species, which are red bats, silver hair bats, big brown bats, hoary bats, are likely to wake up and go get a drink of water in the middle of winter. Um, if there are insects out, they will go and replenish their stores if they can. Cave bats don't have that luxury. They are um, adapted to stay in, in this deep torpor all winter. So it's confusing to know which one's doing what when. You sort of have to know your species. So then we move into spring. And again, the females have stored the sperm over winter. They come out of hibernation or start to return from uh, migration and the sperm fertilizes the ova, the ova implant, and they start to gestate. That seems to be triggered by how warm it is and how much food is available. And that allows pups to be more born in late-ish, mid-late spring. And that is sort of when the insects are really starting to come into abundance. So there's plenty for these females to eat. And a female bat that's lactating is eating her own weight in insects every night. So it is a massive amount of food she needs to take in. First, she has to support her pregnancy and then she has to support lactation. And lactation is the most energy, energetically expensive thing that mammals do. So these females have incredible needs to just consume energy. And then the pups grow really rapidly. This is a mammal that has a growth rate of a songbird. So they go from being naked of one or two grams to being full-sized and flighted, maybe not well, 
but both sides have flighted in six to eight weeks. So that's just a, an amazingly rapid growth rate. So the females are doing that by feeding them this incredibly nutritious milk that they're getting from eating an insane number of insects. So thinking about pregnancy, these pups need to be born in a fairly advanced state. So this is a hoary bat with her two, her twins in there. And that's a lot of baby inside this mom. So bat pups can be as large as 40% of the mother's weight. Most of them run around 25%, but you guys can do the math. I mean, these are big, big babies. So let me see if this video, now for some reason, these videos just seem to not wanna, anyway, what you're looking at right there is a mother who has uh, just given birth to her pup. And you can see that pup's right there. Um, she's grooming it. It just literally just came out. And we were just so lucky that we had a volunteer there who saw her giving birth and was able to, to grab these shots. So um, just really an amazing thing to see. So now we're in late summer. The pups are older. They're learning how to fly and do what it is they need to do. And the insects are still there. So it's a huge source of nutrition. So these young can just gobble down food as, as they get better and better at it. So bat pups will nurse from their mothers up until they're really feeding themselves or until she's tired of it. But mostly they're getting some meals from their mothers as they're transitioning into self-feeding because she doesn't bring food back to them. She can't, I mean, she has to eat it herself. So they do have a kind of tough transition period as they're weaning off nursing and becoming self-reliant. As soon as those pups become independent, the colonies start to break up and that's probably a lot for pest control. And then everybody just starts packing on the fat because they need to either be able to fuel migration or fuel hibernation. But what we see in late summer is all these new bats are out on the landscape and, and they, they make terrible decisions. They're teenagers, basically. They don't really have a lot of good decision-making capability on board. And, and they start to encounter other bats in their, their colony mates or if they're solitary bats, they're just out there on their own. And so we do start, that's where we see sort of a spike in rabies because these naive bats are encountering other bats just as the maternal antibodies are starting to wane. So it's, kind, it's just kind of an interesting um, ecological thing about the way rabies works in bats. If they survive all that, they're going to be heading to, toward hibernacula or heading on to a migratory path. Wait. In the United States, all of our bats are insectivores with two exceptions. And we have our pallid bat, which was recently discovered to be an important pollinator of columnar cactuses. And so this pallid bat, you usually see pictures of them flying off with a centipede or a scorpion, um, but they also do feed on nectar and you can just see how much pollen is covering the face of this bat. And I've seen these guys down in Arizona, they're impressively large, they're a pale bat, they're just beautiful. So if you, if you needed any more excuses to go spend some time in the desert in the summer, you wanna go look for pallid bats. And then um, this should be a really popular bat because this bat is the obligate pollinator of agave. This is a lesser long-nosed long bat. And this bat was on the endangered species list and was just taken off, I think, two years ago, but primarily because of the work of the Batman of Mexico, Rodrigo Medellin. And um, he basically figured out where they, the caves that they used for reproduction were and was able to protect them. So, you know, a single person can just make a huge difference for some of these animals. Um, agave is mostly grown through cloning, but in order to have wild stocks, you need these agave pollinating bats. They also obviously pollinate other cactuses, but um, they have a tight relationship with agave. And as the agave hasn't been allowed to flower, it's caused a decline in these bats which in turn leaves the agave plant susceptible to things like blights because we're losing the wild agave. So if you are an aficionado of tequilas and mezcals, please avoid the cheap stuff. 
you want to go for small batch, small production, small farms, family farms that are doing um, the agave production correctly. So they're leaving some of the, cro the um, crop to flower. So these bats have a food source. And so we can keep this relationship going. There is a bat friendly certification, but I don't think any of um, it is available here in Virginia. Most are insectivores. And well, we're going to skip that one, which is okay because I would talk forever about it. But anyway, um, bats capture insects in flight using echolocation because they can't use eyesight because it's dark out when they're operating and insects are small and erratic. So echolocation allows them to apprehend a small moving thing at night using their voices. Um, eyes use light. So if they were using their eyes, their eyes would have to be enormous and they're small animals. So they can't have enormous eyes. So echolocation operates um, in the ultrasound because the sound wave has to be tight enough to bounce off the object and not just wrap around it and keep going. So when you get a sound wave tight enough to bounce off an insect, it's a very high frequency and thus ultrasonic. Um, they can navigate in total darkness using this. They can discriminate very fine differences in texture and it's really expensive. They literally have to shout because ultrasound attenuates in air. So here we have a sonogram and humans can hear if they're very, very lucky up to about 18 kilohertz. And I guarantee most of us do not hear in to nearly that high frequency. And you can see this bat call, which is a red bat is bottoming out the lowest frequency it's using is up, up around 30 kilohertz. So there's no way our ears can hear this. But it's really expensive. And young bats have to learn how to time their echolocation calls to the speed of themselves and the speed of insects. So learning to catch insects using this system, it's not a hardwired thing. Like they can echolocate, but they have to learn how to use it. So this all leads to a very expensive life. They're small, so therefore they have a fast metabolism. That's just a rule of nature. There's lactation for the females. There's flight, which is insanely energy expensive. And there's echolocation, which is also expensive. So that means they eat an in just incredible amount of food. So those lactating females eating their own body weight and insects every night. Others, non-reproductive bats and males in the summer are eating half their body weight in insects every night just to survive. Um, their hearts are absolutely massive because they have to take in so much oxygen to power flight and everything else. So because of all that, they have to be able to use torpor, which is dropping into a lower met metabolic state overnight. Interestingly, Temperature in the mother's nutrition drives the development of the young. So it's really hard to age bat babies. Like we have an idea within a couple of days to maybe a week, but these guys are growing by the day. And if there's a cold spring and the mom can't stay real warm, it slows the growth of the baby. If there's not a lot of insects out there, it slows the growth of the baby. And we had a cold spring. So we actually had a lot of very late young this year. So. It's kind of an interesting strategy. So they live on the edge. They wake up dehydrated. They're just like and burning up water. Um, so one of the first things they do is to get up and get a drink of water. So if you are near a bat colony and you watch which way they're going, oftentimes you'll see they're headed for water. Um, they use those wing membranes to do a lot of uh, Ex gas exchange across them and they use them to maintain their water balance. So all of that's really crucial to their survival. So roost humidity um, changes in anything that changes the roost they're using may actually force them to leave because it doesn't support them anymore. And they need access to open still water. So if they've been using some farm pond for a hundred years and that pond gets taken over by cattail or gets drained or filled in or whatever, you know, they, they may have some issues finding open water that they can actually use. And I love this series of photos because this is a demonstration of how red bats drink. Bats drink on the wing, they skim the surface. And apparently red bats uh, method is to just open their mouths and dive in 
and then pull up and come out with a mouthful of water. It's just, we get red bats out of swimming pools a lot. And I think this explains why. So they're in trouble. I mean, this is, they, they live their lives on the edge. So it doesn't take much habitat landscape change to really throw them into a tailspin. Um, and so half of the species in Virginia are listed in one way or another, whether it's state or federal, but they're listed. So here's the list, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'd like to point out that no small part of this list happens in urban and suburban areas which we tend to overlook, excuse me, I have a throat tickle. <coughs> um, we tend to overlook those areas as refugia for our delicate species, but they are. I get a lot of tricolors in Northern Long Ears out of Fairfax and Harrisonburg. <coughs> and that's because of habitat loss. Um, uh, the greatest issue that they face is habitat loss. There's increased uh, ambient light levels. We've got forest structures changing constantly. I mean, it's not just loss of trees, it's changes in the understory. As forests get cluttered, bats don't like them as much. Insect guilds are changing, water's changing. And private cave management can be a huge issue for bats. <coughs> Excuse me. Human conflict. I mean, people throw bat colonies out willy nilly. And if that's in the middle of a maternity season, those bats can lose that entire year's pup. I don't wanna call it a crop. The, the entire year's reproductive potential gone. Um, and then people do things like spray and they hose them and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Caves, people are forever throwing trash in caves or blocking them off or setting off fireworks in there because they think it's fun. And then um, fear, people's fears of bats are pretty substantial. I want to touch on rabies because that's one of the biggest fears. Bats don't run around having rabies. If they get rabies, they die of rabies. Rabies is transmitted by bites, not necessarily scratches. Bat bites hurt. Bats do not bite you with a little love nip. They're, it is not the fact that their teeth are so sharp you don't feel it. It is the fact that their teeth are so sharp they don't leave a mark. But it hurts. They're not, they're not gently nipping you. If they're rabid, they're biting to transmit a virus. And if they're biting in self-defense, they're biting in self-defense. So yeah, um, they do have clinical symptoms. We don't like to tell people what they are because we don't expect people to be looking for them. But to experienced people, they're pretty obvious. Um, flying during the day is not unusual. They do get up to get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, get a snack. Um, there is that seasonal spike I talked about earlier. So really, I think um, caution is always warranted when handling bats. So please don't do it barehanded. Leather gloves and a towel is plenty enough to keep you from encountering bat teeth. Bats have been challenged with rabies vaccination. They develop protective titers and they've been shown to seroconvert on small repeated exposures in the wild. So these guys are probably the original rabies vector species. They've lived with the virus for a long time. So they have ways of dealing with it. I'm not saying it's nothing. I'm just saying that it shouldn't be the first thing that comes to mind when someone mentions bat. You can avoid rabies by not getting bitten. And you can avoid being bitten by not doing things like cuddling them or kissing them or licking them or you know the kind of things you wouldn't do with any other wild animal don't do it with a bat um because you know yeah rabies is an issue it's a disease it doesn't seem to be it doesn't have a population effect on bats these other things we're talking about do so for a lot of the fears people have they'll use things like glue boards you know stapled up on a wall to try and catch the bats that are going in and out of their house Glue boards are terrible. Um, people are putting up tape on trees because of spotted, spotted lanternflies, which is catching bats and woodpeckers and all other kinds of songbirds. And then you've got folks out there, this pest control stuff is out of control. And I think people need to do a better job of watching what the pest control community is doing. Um, and obviously you've got people, you know, we've, we're putting tons of pesticides out there on the landscape for reasons probably not necessary, but bats are apex predators. So they are bioaccumulating these pesticides, which are released probably in fat 
which is breast milk. So we are probably contaminating young. And then again, the bioaccumulation comes into play when we have heavy metal um, accumulations. And then we have our beloved mesopredators, which are foxes and raccoons and crows and these medium-sized predators that are really benefiting from the way humans live on the planet. Well, as their numbers come up, they are excellent predators of smaller things. So, and, and then if you have the habitat changes that aren't allowing the bats to have optimal roosts, then you've got these substandard roosts that allow access to these sorts of predators. So crows have an easier time getting to bats that maybe live behind shutters and not in a 500 year old oak tree in a hollow. So uh, it's kind of a, a big question to grapple with, but um, you know, I, I I think the bats are probably being more impacted by this than, than um, has been studied yet. And then we have things that should be helping, but maybe aren't. And wind turbines. Wind turbines are sited where the wind is, which is in the middle of migratory flyways. Bats fly lower than birds. So they are flying right into the rotor swept area of these turbines. And as turbines get larger, that rotor swept area gets larger, and that means more bats are impacting the turbines. Now the wind industry is working with a lot of the, the states and the bat community to try and ameliorate some of these effects, but there's a cost to it. And I, I think no one would argue that our current corporate structures are environmentally friendly. So a loss of profit to the shareholders may not be what they want to do. But things like just stopping the turbines when they're not making energy on low wind nights drops bat mortality substantially, or maybe changing turbine design so they don't have giant rotor swept areas. There are things wind can be doing. Offshore wind, is going to impact bats and it's going to impact birds. And I know everybody, well, it's offshore, there's nothing out there. Yeah, they're getting migratory bat calls on the um, bat detectors that are out there on the research buoys. So yes, that bats are using the Atlantic flyway and we know lots of birds are too. So not saying turbines are something we should walk away from. I'm just saying that turbines maybe need a little work to make them more wildlife friendly because this is the result. This is a dead hoary bat. And this is a beautiful live hoary bat and they should not look like that. Um, looking at wind and hoary bats in particular, uh, this study just came out in 2019 and the species declines are substantial with hoary bats. And it looks like wind turbines at the rate they are scheduled to come online are going to continue to have a growing impact on our highly mig migratory hoary bats. And I think that's something to be very worried about. This is not a particularly abundant bat and it is an amazing animal. And um, I don't think we should lose them for wind. And then white nose syndrome. It's an introduced fungus. It ended up in a single cave in Schoharie, New York. And I'm sorry, I'm checking the time here. I want to wrap real soon, so I'm going to go quick. Um, we've seen losses of over 90% of our cave dependent bats because of this fungus that is now in 37 states and five, four or five Canadian provinces. 90% loss in our little brown bats, possibly just as high in tricolors and northern long ears. So, our bat populations cannot withstand this sort of a loss. Um, so that's where it started. And there you go. That's an insanely rapid spread since 2007. It's one of the fastest and moving and hot, in, most impactful wildlife diseases in recorded history. So it's bad. It's not getting better. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because I want to talk about the insect apocalypse. So we worry about bats going away because of the effect that might have on an explosion of insects that might affect our crops and our, our green spaces and everything else. At the same time, it looks like we might be losing insects at an alarmingly high rate. So will the two things balance each other out? I don't think so. 
But I do think we need to start thinking about what bugs are out there. Nobody knew how many bats were out there before white nose hit. So maybe it's time to start thinking about bugs too. We have the bat trade going on. You can buy taxidermied bats in frames. And I always wonder like, if you walked into a shop and saw somebody had a kitten in a frame, would you be like, oh, that's cool. So um, please avoid it, report it because it's not actually allowed in Virginia. Um, and also beware of some of these places, these uh, scientific supply places are, were selling bats in formaldehyde. Not, it wasn't exactly formaldehyde, but they were selling them to schools to do, you know, bat units with. Well, these bats were harvested during maternity season from caves in Texas. That is not ethical. We don't do that to other wildlife. So why that was, a, that is okay to do to bats is kind of mind boggling. But just know that, that is, it happens, it's out there, be aware. Climate change, you know, climate change. I don't think I need to go into great detail. It's changing things. The bats aren't necessarily handling it well. No, free tails are here now and they weren't before, so. Why do we care? 3.7 billion to agriculture, conservatively. That's pretty amazing. And we do need, if we didn't have that level of service from these uh, pest control, flying pest controllers, uh, the chemical control would probably be unsustainable. So what are we gonna do? Share the love. Please, you know, speak up. I know you do. Yeah, everybody who's here tonight has expressed how much they like bats and wanna know more, talk about them. Um, you know, there's so many ways to talk about bats positively. Um, we don't need pictures of snarly faces with teeth hanging out. Um, oh, bat boxes. Bat boxes are not the only conservation project we could possibly do to help bats. So um, you need to think hard about putting that kind of energy into something that's marginally, if at all, helpful. Citizen science, what a great thing working with partner organizations, yay us, um, work with your local rehabilitators, they need help. I mean, rehabbers are disappearing as quickly as wildlife because we're old and we're getting tired and maybe we'd like to go on vacation every so often. But, um, you know, any way you can help out another organization, help an organization, help a rehabber, you know, keep your yard clean and green, you know, protect your local green spaces, all those sorts of things are really the way we get at helping an animal like bats that we don't interact with on a daily, you know, we don't see them, we're not out there working directly with them, but we can do a great deal to, to help the future of bats. So oh, I'm gonna skip this, you can read it later in the recording. And we're going to take your questions in just a minute because I need to get out a bat so you can talk to me while I'm showing you a bat. And here's some more resources for you, which I'm going to email um, this and you'll be able to get these links for yourself. And I'm going to go ahead and exit this screen. And so I can switch over to my bat cam. So it looks like we have questions in the q and I'm psyched. And I'm gonna switch over to this camera. Now, for some reason, I can only ever see the tiny little square of this camera. So if the bat starts getting out of focus or something, somebody break in and tell me what's going on because it's hard for me to see. So. Our first guest is actually that hoary bat with my please to please think about the horries um, because they don't live in caves, they don't have white nose, but they fly possibly from Canada to Mexico right through those flyways where all the turbines are. So this is a bat that needs our thoughtful help. This is Click. I, um, let me see if I can figure out how to close these other windows so that I can know if, she, can you all see her? Yes. Okay, let me, I've got it set to speaker. Let me see if I can do full screen, what happens there? 
no, no, well, now I see other people with large heads. <laughs> but this is Click, and she is actually echolocating right now. Do you see her, little, her mouth moving? So mm -hmm. we'll turn on the bat detector. We'll see if we can hear her. So that's the bat detector picking up her echolocation calls. So she is probably interested in dinner, though she feels a little full to me. So she may have eaten before I woke her up for this. Oh, did we drop our snack? Sorry. She's got a hold of my... This is one of the reasons we wear gloves. Oh, there we go. She let go. <laughs> She's getting this wrinkle in my glove instead of her mealworm. There we go. How about that? So please ask questions. Um, thank you very much, Leslie, for a great presentation. I just, um, I'll just kind of run through the questions and um, if you have further questions, we put them in the Q&A function. There was one in the chat earlier about white nose syndrome and what's being done in Virginia about white nose syndrome. So white nose syndrome is basically being dealt with by um, with our partners in the cave community for protecting caves, trying to keep people out of important caves during correct seasons and making sure that everyone is decontaminating their gear so that we're not moving it from place to place. But basically it's run through Virginia, the bats are gone. Um, so now it's about protecting summer colonies to keep those survivors reproducing. And I think Click just hiccuped, um, but to keep them, uh, keep the survivors reproducing and keep them, um, giving them the best chance they have of overcoming the fungus when they're hibernating. So nothing real act, a lot of research. Let me check a lot of research, but nothing real active. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question I have to know once and for all, can we get rid of mosquitoes without it indirectly harming bats? I don't know that anybody knows that. Um, so there are many different species, oh, she's not thirsty, okay. There's many different species of mosquito. So if you're talking about diurnal mosquitoes, bats have zero relationship to them. Um, mosquitoes aren't a substantial part of our bats' diets. Our little browns and our tricolors are tiny bats, would eat tons of mosquitoes as they hatched off of wetlands. So if we protect our wetlands, then we're protecting the mosquitoes that bats actually eat. They're not eating the mosquitoes that are flying around in your yard bothering you because that's not worth it energetically. So that's kind of a tough question to get an answer to. So I don't think there's a once and for all answer. Thank you. Um, the next question, can you please address the issue of reduced bat populations in Central Virginia and throughout their entire range and their numbers beginning to recover? Well, <laughs> you guys have great questions. So we have to know the baseline before white nose hit. And guess what we don't know? People weren't counting bats other than hibernators in caves because bats were not viewed as a particularly sexy animal to be researching. I think it's only been because of people like Merlin Tuttle that really brought bats into the forefront of interesting animals that people should pay attention to. Um, so we, we really don't have a lot of baseline data on bats. We have a lot of post white nose data on cave hibernating bats. We don't know how many hoary bats were ever there to know if the ones we have now are down or up. So yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. You have to know the first number in order to get a stab at the second, and we don't know the first number. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, next question is, do bats have tails? They do. So I'm glad this is one I can answer. <laughs> I'm very excited. So we're looking at uh, clicks butt blanket right now. I'm gonna try and undo her tail membrane and stretch it out. And she's like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't I see a little foot. She's like, all right, so now I, so her tail is actually right here and it wraps around her belly and you can't see it, but there's a triangular piece of membrane that her tail inhabits. So 
when she's flying, it sticks out like a triangle, but you are getting a good view of her feet, I hope. She has fuzzy feet. That's a tree bat characteristic. I'm actually gonna oh, do how? something really quick while she's very, while she's being still and quiet. And I'm going to show you, she's the only one who'll let me do this. Oh, wow. So there's her wing and watch what happens when I let go of it. So that's that elastic membrane I was talking about. And I'm actually gonna, cause she's not really interested in dinner right now. Um, well, she's echolocating a little bit, but I'm gonna put her away and I'm gonna get out the other bat. Um, <laughs> of course I say that she's like wakes up all of a sudden, but I do want you to see the big brown bat up close. So you've seen the hoary bat. And she's also incredibly well fed right now. I can feel how chunky she is in my hand. So I suspect she's had a very generous dinner before I decided to bring her out. So let me get out Flip, who's usually pretty excited about extra snacks. So go ahead and keep asking questions while I get him out. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, how is the age of a bat determined? <laughs> that is really tough because they don't seem to age the way other mammals do. Um, we know when they're really old because their teeth are very worn, but other than that, there's, you can't count the rings. They don't have tooth eruption patterns like some mammals do. Um, by the time they are a few months old, they're adult size. So we can sometimes tell from their pelage, from their fur and their basic behavior, whether they're this year's young, but once they're a year over their first winter, they pretty much look like this until they get really old and then their teeth get dull. So this is Flip, he's a big brown bat. This is our ubiquitous, lives everywhere in the suburbs. Um, the next question, if the bat's wing membrane is torn or injured, will it heal properly or will it significantly hinder the bat's mobility? So when their membranes are torn and it goes through that airfoil, like a complete tear renders them unable to fly. So they will heal with time and safety. So when someone calls us and has a torn wing membrane, we're like, yeah, you know, fine, we, we can take care of that. Broken wings don't always heal like that. Holes are often not a big issue for bats. We've, I've seen them flying with holes in their wings big enough I could poke my finger through. So, um, it's an amazing thing, this membrane, but a torn membrane is a showstopper unless they can get to safety and stay in safety while it heals. Um, next question, I learned that hoary bat is the only bat, only bat that is endemic to the Hawaiian islands. Yeah. It's amazing that they made it to the, to the islands 10,000 years ago. How do you think they made it there over, over the oceans? Possibly was it a little passenger on a seafaring vessel and then establish itself once it hit landfall? No, because I think the hoary bats are migratory. They're highly migratory. So probably more like storm winds. We get lots of out of range animals because of um, weather patterns and storm events. So because one animal on a vessel or you know getting blown across does not a population make, it has to be something repeatable. And so I think we're looking at a migratory animal that is probably got repeatedly got caught up in weather events that made it easier to reach land. And Stephanie, hey. let's do one more question before we have to wrap up, sadly. Oh, sure. Um, and, and this might be a good one just to actually wind up with. How, we, how can we help bats to thrive in our yards? And what about water sources? So water features are always a good thing. Um, obviously they need to be big enough for a bat to drink out of. So um, while we do know the small bats can use elevated platforms like bird baths, a small pond is nice. Clean and green, reduce pesticide use, plant natives, um, pretty much all the same stuff you would do if you wanted a thriving songbird population, thriving insects. You are just helping everybody, including bats by doing that. Awesome. 
Um, well, everyone, I hate to have to stop our Q&A here, um, but I want to respect everyone's time tonight, including um, Click and Flip and Leslie. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for this incredible um, window into our bats and, and getting an idea of what we can do to be their advocates. Um, I'm just going to pop up my slides for one more second. Let me... And uh, Misty, I'm going to turn it over to you really fast. Awesome. I hate to interrupt a bat. I am so sorry, everyone. Thank you so much, Leslie. This has been amazing. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the reason we're able to do this tonight is because of members of Wild Virginia who support our work. So if you are already a member, thank you. If you're not, please become one tonight. You just hop over to wildvirginia.org and you can sign up at any level that's comfortable for you. Uh, what you help us do is put on events like this and also protect wild places and the habitats these creatures need to live. So it's incredibly important and we're so grateful to all of you for being here tonight and taking the time to learn about the incredible species that are here in Virginia. And Betty's gonna tell you about our upcoming events. We have two things that are planned for um, for November. The first is um, the first and the biggest is our film festival, and that will be taking place on the weekend of November 12th to the 14th. And when you sign up, um, what's really cool about it is you sign up and you can log in to watch the films um, whenever you want during that weekend. And so, if you're a person who wants to drink it in the evening with a cup of wine a glass of wine, or if you want to watch them in the morning with a cup of coffee, you can do that. And um, our feature film for that event is Cascade Crossroads. And that is a film about um, wildlife connectivity. So I think those of you who are interested in bats will be interested in um, wildlife connectivity in general, will probably really enjoy that film. And then our second event um, in November is our book club and we'll be reading and talking about a book called The Seed Keeper. It's a little bit of a departure for us because it is actually a novel rather than a nonfiction book, but it, um, it is ultimately about um, connection to the land. And I think that's something that also is probably near and dear to a lot of our hearts. So I hope that you can join us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Betty, Misty, Stephanie, Leslie, everyone else that helped make this happen. Um, we will get you this recording as well as all of the resources that Leslie has outlined for us and a bunch of links. Um, and Leslie, I'll let you close us out if you want. If you have any final words, we can't thank you enough. This was incredible. I had to unmute myself. Yeah, thank you so much for making this happen, all your planning, all your chasing me down. Um, it, it really was a wonderful thing. I'm glad to see so many people came out here. Um, I don't want to, anyone to think that I'm poaching, but we do desperately need volunteers um, for both bat care and for um, educational outreach and just the mundane day-to-day -day stuff that all nonprofits have to go through. So. Um, Again, thank you all so much. Thank you for everything you do and the wonderful work that Wild Virginia does. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night.